You may be wondering what this photorealistic snake is doing. Well, he brought along some of his friends to help test the performance of procedural animation within Unreal Engine. And in this video, we're going to compare procedural animation using Control Rig to traditional animation where you would use an animation blueprint and keyframed animations. So to get started, I will show you what mesh we're using. So this is a simple low poly skeletal mesh to try to minimize any impact of actually rendering the skeletal mesh. And it has 11 bones. So it has the main bone and then one bone for each tail segment. So what we're going to do is make it so that each one of these bones does a trace downwards and wherever it hits the floor, we're going to position the bone at that location. So to do that, we're going to get the children of the parent bone or the main bone. And for each one of these, we are going to do a trace. So I want to include the parent bone so it will move the head as well and recursive so it will find every bone in this hierarchy. So as it loops through all of these bones, we're going to get the position of that bone. So we do get transform. And then we're going to do a sphere trace. And the positions that we're going to trace from and to is going to be the position of this bone plus 1000 units. So 1000 units above the character. And the end position is going to be the position of the bone as it was, but minus 1000 units. And wherever this trace hits, we're going to position this bone. So we can drag out from this and do set transform. Connect up the execution path in the loop. And for the value, we're going to use this hit location. So now what we'll find is that when we simulate, these snakes are tracing to the floor and positioning the bones as close to the floor as they can at each segment. And the characters are being animated through the actor. So the actor is just on tick, which is not a good way to do things, moving the relative location of the skeletal mesh. So it's just moving it back and forth by a thousand units. So there's no FPS cap. And I've set this up in a way where we'll just about reach 100 FPS. So you can see that it's going between 99 and 100. And that's with 400 characters. So each one of these is a character actor. And there are 400 of them. And each one is performing a trace for every bone. So they're doing 11 traces each. So currently in total, there are 4,400 traces every single frame and we're hitting 100 FPS. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove the control rig from being used from the animation graph at all. So now it should just be the default character with no animations and we'll test again. And you'll see that we're hitting 100 FPS and it's still dipping to 99, but I would say it's more frequently at 100. So there is some change to that, but pretty much negligible. And you could do more detailed testing than this and just looking at the FPS counter, but this is the simplest way I thought to do it. So let's just exaggerate things a little bit. And so within Control Rig, instead of just doing one trace per bone, we're going to do the same thing 10 times. So it's just going to loop and do this 10 times. So we'll do a for loop and a loop count of 10. And now you'll see no impact because I didn't connect it back up in the animation blueprint. But now you should see there's quite a performance impact where we're dropping down to 70, 80. So this is now with 44,000 traces every frame. So in this very extreme scenario where you're doing 44,000 traces every frame, you do get some performance impact. However, this is when we're doing traces. Now, traces are more CPU intensive than just doing some simple math. So let's just test while still keeping the loop. So it's doing this 10 times for every bone, which is 11 bones and then 400 actors. What we'll do is we'll just connect some values into the set translation for each bone. So we'll get the initial X and the initial Y, but for the Z, let's do the in initial Z plus, and we'll do accumulated time. So that's just a running counter that runs whilst this control rig is active. And we will take the sign of this value and then multiply the result by 
say 100 and plug that in and then connect that to the Z. So now you can see that the character is going up and down and the further the bone is down the chain the more it's actually being affected by this. So let's take a look at how things are now. So you can see that we're 99 around 100 and that's with the set transform node being run 44,000 times a frame. So the first thing to gather from this is that if you do a lot of sphere tracers, 44,000, you're going to start noticing some FPS problems. So now I'm going to make it use the sphere trace again, and I'm going to change the loop count to 20. So that's doubling how many it's doing, and it's doing it for every bone and every character. So now we can see the FPS is taking a big hit. We're now down to 40, maybe 45 FPS. So to bring some perspective to this, each one of these characters is doing 220 sphere tracers every frame. Now, I'm not sure what game would require 220 tracers for a given character, and even if you did need that for some reason, you probably wouldn't also have 400 of the same character. A more realistic scenario is you might have a character that needs to do two tracers every single frame. So, for example, if that was a human character, you could do one trace for each foot. Or... If you wanted to, you could use a character that had more than two legs, but you only need to do the traces intermittently, so on average there are only two traces being performed every frame. And in those situations, even if you had this many characters, so you had 400 characters on screen, it really wouldn't be a noticeable problem. But if we're talking about some extreme scenarios, let's say you're trying to replicate an entire physics engine within control rig by using a lot of traces and you need to do that every single frame for every character. There are still ways that you could sort of get around this issue of performance if it becomes an issue. So the simplest way would be to treat it like you would with an LOD for a character mesh. So the level of detail can be scaled based on the distance and you'll be familiar with making skeletal meshes simplified as they are further into the distance. Well you can do the same with control rig. So instead of doing, in this current case, 220 traces every frame, for distant characters, you could reduce that number so that maybe they do it less frequently or maybe you use less traces. And for some very distant characters, you could maybe just turn it off altogether so it's not doing anything within Control Rig. So I'll quickly show you a simple way that you could set something like this up. So in the animation blueprint in the event graph, on event blueprint begin play, I'm just getting a reference to the play camera manager. So that's wherever the camera is in the game. And then I'm promoting that to a variable. And then within the anim graph, instead of having a pin plugged in for the location, what I'm doing is I was choosing the camera manager, which is the variable that I created, and get camera location. And this is an input into control rig. So I created a variable in control rig, which is called viewer location and I made it editable so that we could plug values into it. And all we would need to do is get the view location and get the distance between that and we want to get the current character, but th remember this is in world space, so we want to get where this character is in world space. So what we can do is we can do to world and plug that in. And if we leave these values blank, that just gets 0, 0, 0 from rig space and converts it to a world space coordinate. So now we can compare this world space with this world space. And that should find the distance between the viewer and where this character is in world space. So what we could do is say if this value is less than 30,000, we just do nothing. So I'll do a quick branch. So on true, we connect that to our loop. And otherwise we do nothing. So what you'll see when we play in the viewport is that these characters at the front are doing the procedural motion. So they're tracing to the ground and moving up and down. But the ones that are about here, they're no longer doing anything at all. It's just like the animation blueprint is doing nothing. And what you'll see is that there's some popping going on where some of the characters switch because of the distance. So as the distance reaches over that threshold, they'll switch back to no animation. So if you look at this particular snake, you'll see that it switches and then when it comes slightly closer you'll see it's using the procedural system again. So obviously we don't want that. So what you can do is let's just take this distance and we're going to remap that value. So we're going to remap so the maximum is going to be 30,000 because that's what we've chosen as our hard limit. And I'm going to say the minimum of 20,000 
So between 20,000 and 30,000, we're going to blend between 1 and 0. So any values below 20, it will use the value of 1. Any values above 30, it will use the value of 0. So it's just a gradual decline from 1 to 0. And if we plug this result into the weight of this node, that means that it will fade off the change from this system from a distance of 20,000 to 30,000. And anything beyond that won't be used at all. So this value is irrelevant after that point anyway. So now what you'll see is you can't immediately see the cutoff point of where it stops using procedural animation because a lot of these characters are quite far in the distance. So you, you can't make out that they're not really tracing to the ground. And you could add some random motion just to make it seem like they're not static and just sliding left and right. But for the most part, you wouldn't be able to tell what's really going on at such a distance. So currently remember that we're doing 20 times as many traces as we'd actually need to. So let's just take a look at the FPS. And we're getting around 75 to 80. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take out any reference to the distance limit. So that also includes the weight here. So now every character is doing all of these 20. And you'll see that now the FPS drops to around 40, 45. But you can't see any real difference here. You can't really notice that these characters in the distance are tracing to the ground. So it's worth it to just limit things by distance if you're dealing with this many characters and this many traces. But once again, this is whilst we're doing 20 traces. So let's just cut that out and we'll go back to how we were before. And we'll also include this distance limit so this is you can treat this like an LOD and we'll plug the weight in just so there's a smooth blend so it doesn't just immediately cut off. So you'll see now that we're at 100 FPS and with a 10 millisecond frame time. And it's important to keep in mind that all of the comparisons we're doing is comparing control rig doing as many traces as it was for each test compared with a completely empty animation graph which is doing nothing. So in a real situation, you'd likely have maybe various state machines which are blending between different animations. You're layering different bonds together. You may be doing traces. So you might be doing traces in the event graph. You might be looking up values. So there may be some more processing going on in an actual use case where you're using keyframed animations, as well as just the overhead of actually looking up what the keyframed animation is. But we're giving it the best chance with the anim graph and just treating it like you have the most optimized, perfect way of doing traditional animation using keyframed animations compared to using a pretty exaggerated version of control rig. But even with the control rig being blank and just connected up, you'll see that even though this is doing nothing, you'll see that we're still hitting the lower end of 100 FPS. So we're usually on 99. And with no other changes and where all we're doing is disconnecting the control rig from the anim graph, when we play, you'll see that we're over 100. So no matter what optimizing you do within control rig, there will still be maybe a loss of one or two frames. And that's, again, comparing to using nothing in the animation blueprint. But just as an example, if you're doing something like this on tick, simply not using the tick event implemented in Blueprint will give you a lot more FPS. So if I just delete this tick event, then compile, we're now up to about 130, 120 with a seven millisecond frame time. So the performance impact of all the exaggerated things that we're doing in Control Rig is pretty negligible compared to simply deleting the event tick from your Blueprint. So in my opinion, for 99% of use cases, 99% of the time, you're not going to have any problems using procedural animation. But there's always cases where you're doing something really extreme and pushing it to its limits with a lot of characters. So if you have any concerns about whether or not procedural animation is too intensive to use for your game, I would recommend just testing it. So set up a simple test case like this with however many characters you're going to need and approximate how much work the, the actual control rig is going to need to do. So for example, how many traces you need or how many calculations you'd need and just do some exaggerated test case just to see when you actually run into performance problems to see if that will actually affect the game. But to be fair, you would also have to do the same for the animation graph. So if you're going to test compared to another method, you would have to test how that method would actually perform. So including complex state machines, if you're going to need those different blends, 
ad additive animations and so on. And keep in mind that I've just suggested a very simple way to minimize the performance impact just by limiting by distance. But there are obviously a lot more things you could do. So you could reduce the frequency of how many traces there are. You could reduce the number of bones that actually need tracing. You could reduce the timing of when those traces need to take place. So just for example, if the character's foot or leg or whatever bone is not touching the floor, doesn't need to be touching the floor, that bone doesn't need to be doing a trace on every single frame, only whilst it's either going to contact the floor or you need to make sure it's not passing through the floor. And you could also tick the animation at a lower frequency. And depending on the specifics of your code, obviously there are a lot of ways that you could optimize that and improve it. But I would say for the most part, it's not really something you have to worry about. It's certainly not as bad as most people think. And it's a very common question I get asked about procedural animation is how the performance compares. And I wanted to keep this video just a general overview. So I'm not going into a deep dive of doing profiling to check the exact difference between the frame rates and comparing different animation graphs with complex control rigs. I just wanted to give a general overview of how minimal the performance impact is, even if you're doing things that are quite extreme. So again, 4,400 traces and getting basically no performance impact. And it's only when you really ramp that up with a lot of loops that you'll start to notice problems. So thanks for watching and let me know if you want me to go into this in more detail or if you have any other topics that you'd like me to cover.